So let's just get into it. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Annika Tabochnik, and I'm the Creative Aging Program Associate at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. Um, and this is Show and Tell. Today, our guest is Cara Wells, who's going to talk to us a little bit about some amazing uh, research and interest that she's found in the art of Goya. And I can just pass it off to her now. I'm going to start presenting these slides. So let's see um, if this works out and looks nice for everyone. There you go. It's up and running for everyone. Wonderful. So, Cara, if you want to take it away. So, um, in a, a New Yorker this fall, there was a Peter Schlegel uh, review of a new biography of, um, of Goya. And it was a four-page review, so it was, fairly, it was fairly significant, but it certainly caught my eye. And, um, and I, I bought the book intending to give it away as a Christmas present. But it was too scholarly for the person I had intended it for. <laughs> it, has, it has an 80-page uh, notes, bibliography, and um, other esoteric academic details. So, um, and the book is not, and the book is a daytime read. It's small print and requires a lot of concentration. So, and this last time, I think it's taken me three months to read a book. But um, it just reminded me of, um, of, for me, Goya's work is so, so contemporary to um, and remains just as, um, as important today as it did 200 years ago when the etchings were created. I'm far more interested in the etchings because I think, um, because I think they transcend time. The paintings are the paintings. I'm not interested in, you know, in jewel encrusted velvets. I'm I'm interested in the politics of the time, which um, the disasters of war, especially the Capriccios. So anyway, I'm just going to explain these. Um, I'm going to explain these because they're. Um, I actually have um, a book with the complete etchings of Goya here at my um, here at home. And um, the Capriccios were the first ones done, and they were developed. Um, they were sort of he did the he did those um, in the eighteen no in the seventeen nineties, and he had been in Madrid um, s since the age of fifty. No, I'm sorry, thirty. But um, and he started. Oh, wait a sec. Do I want to go back? I, this is not going the way I wanted it to go. Um, anyway, just these are the, these are the the four um, main books of his etchings are the Capriccios, the Disasters of War, the Art of Bullfighting, and the Proverbs, also, um, which also has a different name that I'll tell you about when we get to it. The Art of... Um, the one fascinating thing about Goya is he he believed in lifelong learning. And so while the first two are, are pure etchings, the art of bullfighting is lithography. Um, and the proverbs were back to etching. So let's, can we go to the next slide? So here's Goya's self-portrait at uh, 50. And in 1796, he was just recuperating from um, what is called, um, it's a form of colic, and it left him deaf and from lead poisoning, which came from the voluminous amount of white lead paint he was using at the time. So um, he, it, he was very sick for... Um, from 1792 to really um, 1795, which is when he really started working again. So this was his self-portrait. Next. So 
when he when he start when he Spain was sort of a wasteland in um, when he first moved to Madrid in uh, seventeen. I try to get this right about seventeen ninety, and so he started his serious study because there was nothing else to look at. He started by copying all Velasquez's paintings because he considered those to be the last of the great Spanish artworks. So um, Diego, um, so Sebastian was the, um, if we can go back for just a sec, was the, um, I don't care, I can't remember what you called, uh, was the, um, the jester, I think. Jester. Well, he was the jester, but he was also, um, there's a, a smaller body type. You're a dwarf. He was a dwarf, um, which is why he, um, wh which is why he's so short. And so you, so you can see the copying technique, but you can see the etching lines in the back, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And this is how he, he really, studied his technique and really developed as a mature artist. Next slide, please. So that by 1801, he had actually become the court painter. And this is perhaps one of one of the most famous family portraits in, in the world. Um, certainly the famous royal part, portraits. Um, and I think it's very fitting that you will not be wearing military, you will not be wearing your military sashes and uh, to the Duke's funeral tomorrow. But you'll note the presence of stat um, and uh, of this of all the medals. And way over in the back of the painting is behind the canvas is Goya. Um, Cara, would you mind speaking a little bit about how uh, Goya got to be painting for the royal family? Oh, right. I forget. Our slides are a little out of order. He um, he really came into his own artistically de designing, uh, at the age of 30, designing cartoons for tapestries. And the tapestries were for the royal houses. So they were, um, so he came to the attention of the royal family at that time. And by, and um, there's also one other, beyond the cartoons, there's one other major slide that you'll see shortly of a liturgical uh, commission that he won. It was an open competition, but you'll see that in just a minute. Um, and it's still uh, in the same beautiful shape today and can be seen in the church outside of um, outside of Madrid. And the Duke and Duchess of Azuna um, were his major patrons. Um, and they were they really uh, introduced him to other like individuals who um, his portraiture was so fresh and so naturalistic that lots of people were absolutely fascinated with the change in how in his approach and how natural people looked and how warm and friendly the paintings were next and here we can see the duchess of alba was um was another patron and you can see when we talk about his use of white white paint, which is all, which is where the heaviest lead content was in this white paint. So this is also the first po full length portrait that anybody, all historians know of that have no feet. So, um, which is the other interesting thing. And again, it's, it's full length, but it's not done in a formal setting. It's done in, it's done in en plein air um, with the open landscape behind. Next. Okay, and this is the Royal Chapel in La Florida, Madrid, and um, I, can, can we, can you blow them up a little, uh, Attica, so we can show everybody some of the detail in these or not? So 
this is the whole dome of 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 the cathedral, and this is the of the center dome of the cathedral. But you can see what an extraordinary. I mean, this took him years upon scaffolding to do this. But it's really um, again, it's the freshness of of you know the, of the fact that it's landscape and it. it and what was and the paintings of the of the individuals and of course it's the stories of saints i'm not a liturgical person so i can't recite them to you um fortunately <laughs> uh will spare you but they're absolutely stunning stunning works this is the only commission he did of this of this size and nature And then we're making a huge leap, um, and and the difference between the years of his portraits um, and the second of May was the Napoleonic invasion of Spain, um, which occurred in which overthrew the monarchy, brought in um, and brought in six years of French rule. It also brought in a tremendous amount of famine and devastation and um, and again, almost civil war. So this, um, the white horse, the, the um, white horse, they're attacking the Marmadukes who were Napoleon's personal guard and they were Turks who were you know, noted for their, um, to, to, their tenacious battle. Um, abilities they were um they were um hard at it as you can see and if we could just go um to the next one and then i'm going to go back in between a little the third of may is also again seen in his etchings and um it, this is the french shooting on the spanish rebels and it just went it just went on and on and on and the situation became became so bad that eventually um wellington got involved and the english came down and threw the french out of spain and then you hit, hit even more turbulent times which we'll see when we get into some of the etchings Next slide. Up one. Back to the chalk drawing. So this this would have been um, this was a drawing done about the time he started the bullfighting series. But it's a chalk drawing, and I just want you to see the detail and notice the because you're going to be seeing the rest of the rest of what we're going to be seeing in the drawings are all etchings, um, and a few and a few lithographs. Um, so the interesting thing to me was one. Um, so I read the book. All of a sudden, the New York Times has a big article on the Friday art section. There's actually a um, a Goya drawing um, exhibition at the Met right now, and a lot of these current, a lot of these images come from that exhibit, um, which is a hundred works on paper. And the Met has it's up to the fifth of May if anyone wants to scoot up to New York. Um, but I just thought that all the, the way all of this came together is really quite is really quite unusual, and I wish I could go see these because I just love the work so much. Um, so this is a chalk drawing and then we'll go into the etchings. So, um, and I think the other thing that for me, um, you know, guns were, guns were still, I think, single shot at that time. And wouldn't it be nice if they were single shot today and you had to take the time to really load a gun instead of just um, instead of just uh, having 45 mass shootings in a month. Um, but it was it was a horrible time. 
And the conflict just went on and on and on. So, and you see, you see the date 1863, that's the date, um, that's the date it was printed. The uh, the first book, the Carpuccios, was printed during Goya's time. And it was actually printed in uh, 1799. And the Duchess of Osana bought four copies at, um, and he saw, they were sold briefly um, to the public. You could buy one for an ounce of gold. And that was all, I think, 70 lithographs that were in, um, in that first book. And then he actually, um, I don't know how he was so sensitive to the, um, to what would, to what was going ahead. He gave, um, he, he gave the, um, the prints, the blocks, the etching blocks to the Spanish king. So that these were preserved by the Spanish government and eventually um, the other three books of etchings also went to the Spanish government. And so these were actually, the Prada actually dates to, eight, uh, to 1819. So they were already into their museums fairly early. And these would have certainly been a prominent part of, um, of that, as well as the fact that they held the rest of the former royal uh, collection. But that's why the date is 1863. It's the publishing date. And, um, you know, the traumas of war, the traumas of violence, the separation. Um, I mean, the, the, that's what these are. That's what these deal with. And the thing for me is that to me, they're so timeless because we're still dealing with these same issues today. <clears throat> um, violence, whether it's be Syria or Afghanistan, um, or the United States. Violence is violence, and it's just, um, it's, I'm not going to, I'll stop, so I'm not going to say it's, it's barbaric. Um, and we hope that, you know, we hope that someday it won't be necessary. Um, but this politics, next. So, and and for the for the residents of Spain, they, it was it was so much coming and going. They were um, because because of the fighting, and they had been were were they had had a very very sedentary lifestyle. All of a sudden, it was um, it was so disrupted by um, by this war. Um, and these are these are prisoners that you can see you can see through the, the black line that ties them all together, and um, they're just being transported back and forth. But it's also um, just please you know try to take a good note at his technique. I mean the the shading in these things I think is extraordinary um, from the light background to the dark. The darkness that goes down into the rocks, I think, um, just the detail is really quite extraordinary for the process. Um, so these Would are all. Oh, sorry. Would you want to say a few words about where Goya was during the war? What was, what was he doing aside from making this artwork? Well, actually, he had uh, Goya had pretty much of an international reputation by this point, and he was still doing a lot of portraits, and people who were um, who people who were not normally in Spain were in Spain, and had and sought him out for portraits. Um. But this one at 1810 would have been outside of outside of the the four groups of etchings. But this so this would have been um, one that was specifically um, because of the date on it. I can tell um, just his specific reaction to the war. And it wasn't just war because of, because of war often it was war 
and by t by 1812 the war was pretty much over but it was it was drought and famine so it was just it was basically almost 10 years of constant constant turmoil for the spanish people and dur during this time you know they no longer had the americas they no longer had uh, other forms of income so the company, the country was really going deeply into debt to carry on the war and obviously dealing with um, dealing with a dying culture as people as I mean, to, over 20,000 people died of the famine. Um, and I don't know, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have population figures um, for Spain at the time, but you can tell if 20,000 people died by famine, you can see it was fairly extreme. And again, this, go, this goes back to the disasters of war. You can again tell by the date, which was because the, it was published um, at that point, 30 years after his death. No, 40, 45 years after his death. Um, Goya was actually by this by eighteen sixteen. Goya's health was beginning to fail, um, and it wasn't. And you have to remember, all he's, he's doing all of this being deaf. I don't know how how you converse with someone whose portrait you're painting when you're deaf. You obviously don't. Um, we have declining health. Um, by and by 1820, he actually is exploring the notion of mood. There's a, a group of others. The turmoil, turmoil has become too much, and there's a group of Sp Spaniards who have moved to Bordeaux, and he actually moves to Bordeaux permanently in 1824, and that's where he and he dies there four years later. So at 82. How many, and he still was making art up until, you know, his 80th year. So I think it's an extraordinary life. And he was always commenting on what was going on. And the, what looks like the dunce's cap is actually part of the Inquisition. If the, the religious authorities didn't like what you were doing, then this, and this has got to be one of his Carpaccios. Um, that's how you would be branded. You would have your dunce's cap on and usually some other comment. Um, some people were tied to post some, um, but it was the inquisition disapproving of, of individual behavior. Um, this was actually one of the last um, pieces he did. It, he, it says 1818, um, this is the, the giant. Um, and this is a drawing, um, but it's 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 um, again the he only did uh, this and one other. Um, he only did two nudes, the giant, and um, what probably was the Duchess of Al um, of Alba before her death. We don't know for sure if that's who the model was. But it was called a Maja, and um, it was the only nude painting he did. And eventually, the, the Inquisition took both uh, the nude painting and there was a painting of the same woman with clothing on, and those were locked up by the Inquisition as being inappropriate for public viewing. Um, you just didn't paint nudes in uh, 1818. It just wasn't done. Um, and this is the last drawing he, this is supposedly the last drawing he did. And by this time he is, he is in Barcelona. He is obviously pretty much well integrated into that community. And, um, and still, and this is just a guy standing on his head. Um, so. I'd love to um, ask if you could, uh, talk a little bit about how Goya's family handled his artwork after his death. Oh, okay. So Goya, ha um, Goya had 
eight children by his wife, only one lived, and one grandson. And fortunately, all of the etchings um, eventually went to the um, went to the, the government. But um, his last series of paintings were called the Black Paintings, and they were actually in the house that his grandson lived in. And this is, you can see why that he gave them to the government, because the grandson actually cut the murals off the wall, had them reinstalled, and sold them. And, um, and Goya had very carefully taken, but, but this exchange with the government involved a lifelong pension for both his son and his grandson over time. That, that's what he got in return for giving the government the control over the etchings. Um, so by, um, so, you know, granted it was a lifelong relationship until he moved, but he didn't see, and he did return to Madrid a couple of times from France, but it, he was not, by that time, he actually had a mistress and a couple of her children living with him in Bordeaux. So he was no longer close with his sons. Um, but he did still see them until the end of his life. Okay. So th this is this is a statement from um, the wonderful Thomason bi uh, biography, and this is um, and and Senator is uh, is basically your state of being, your state of mind. And his was all, and so what she's saying here is Goya's senator is, det is detachment, regardless of the degree of pressure, professional or psychological, he may have been under. He leaves his subjects alone as he was alone, and he leaves us alone with them. Rarely consummate in, in the ways that we associate with great art, Goya cranked out lots of so-so pictures. He is an outlier's outlier in the canon. His legacy isn't a commanding body of work, but a homing beacon for worried people in worlds that are subject to unpredictable changes, perhaps sudden and soon. Goya knew the problem and let slip the solution, which is to keep in mind there is no solution, only an, immor an immemorial question, now what? And I think, you know, and I think it's that openness of, uh, of, of his approach that makes these timeless. Um, he's not he's not forming an opinion. He's just showing you what he saw, and letting you make your own opinion. And so, for me, um, they're just um, they're just as applicable today as they were two hundred years ago.